There is a lot to be said here in Deuteronomy chapter 25. A lot. I, I, I want to try to get through all of Deuteronomy 25 today in one video to move on to Deuteronomy 26. Um, which goes in a totally different direction. But 25 finishes off the, the thread from 24. So I kind of want to do the whole thing at once. I think it would be too confusing to make a series of videos, or maybe it wouldn't be. I don't know. The thing that came to my mind when I <laughs> thought of it, as I was saying it. Uh, I'm having a look, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about this one, even though I believe I'm being obedient by doing this. Um, it's, it's, um, I'm calling this one selfishness. More, more, morally bankrupt people are selfish. And I, and I think this is what this shows in Deuteronomy chapter 25. Just morally bankrupt people. People who are wicked. And, and I want to discuss that part of it uh, with you before we get into the scripture. Because I want to go over the, the scriptural part pretty quickly. As I'm discussing with you the importance of community, you have to understand, or you don't have to, but I, I would, I'm asking you to understand. By the way, for my kids, my grandkids, my brothers and sisters in Kenya, my brothers and sisters in Ghana, my brother in Bangladesh. And whomever else considers me a teacher, God bless you. I want you to consider, because we're talking about community. What I said before we started talking specifically about community, which is this last season of Christianity has all been about, has been mostly about personal exceptionalism in God. In other words, you can have whatever you want. They call it the prosperity gospel. I'm not saying that it wasn't God ordained to have this season of the prosperity gospel because it happened. And God is in control. He knew that was going to happen, and it happened. The prosperity gospel. The challenge is it did not uh, emphasize the importance of the journey of a community. It got more into individualism, individual success. It moved the families more into the 80s and the 90s of two-parent homes that both husband and wife worked. Uh, nothing wrong with that, except it would be better if both husband and wife worked and one income was lived on and another income was invested. Most of us did not do that in the 70s, 80s, 90s, or even the 2000s. I believe my daughter's generation will do that or are doing that. She's 36. I think this generation of people are smarter. They understand the concept of community and not because we necessarily taught it to them. <laughs> it was more out of a it was more out of a necessity, which is the reason why these apps come up where you share 
homes, share cars, share boats, share workspaces. This, in re, even though is is this has been manufactured, this is the natural position of someone who is operating in a community. That's how I know God is in control. Because community is all about sharing resources. Sharing responsibilities. The unfortunate truth, I believe it's a truth, or maybe just a fact, but the unfortunate fact, let's go with fact, is most of us who have the understanding of individuals, individual success find it a burden to take on a collective attitude. I, I'll, 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 I will personally uh, admit that this thing that I'm sharing right now was hard for me because I've been doing collective stuff for a while, wanting to do things on an individual basis. When in truth, the highest and best use of an individual within the kingdom is to be collective in their thinking. That's the reality. The best way to succeed is to do it with a community. Because there are things that other people understand and have wisdom in that you don't. And your willingness and their willingness to yield to each other gives you all a greater chance of success. Now, if you're talking just money success, you're missing the point. This kind of success I'm talking about is all about covering the family. If one family member is in trouble, there are other family members that come to the come to come to the person to help. I believe relationships are more valuable than money. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 1. If there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment that may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. It didn't say the sinful. It didn't mean the sinful. The wicked is aware. Aware of what they're doing. And they're doing it with the heart to be wicked. They're not talking about the person who made a mistake. Because keep in mind, this is coming towards the end of the lessons of Moses. Moses. 
we, we only have a few chapters left before Joshua takes over. This says, controversy between men and they come unto judgment that may judge them then they shall justify the righteous who's they they shall justify the righteous based upon the rules of the community and condemn the wicked This is just a morally bad person. This is somebody who doesn't want to follow the rules of the community. Not interested in being a part of any kind of solutions in the community. From this point on, it will talk about or, or it, it will highlight, that's the word I want, some of those things. Verse 2. And it shall be if the wicked man worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face, according to his fault, by a certain number. Forty stripes, verse 3. He may, be, he may give him not exceeding, uh, not, to, not exceed, lest he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes. Then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. Forty stripes. Forty has spiritual significance. The idea, well, before we go there, no, let's go there. When you're punishing a wicked person, the idea is to get them not to be wicked. You're not educating them. They already know. You're not trying to get them to understand. They already understand. What you're trying to do is get them just to change and go with what they already understand. They understand they are wicked. I remember years ago talking to this one guy about something and I and I admit I was just overzealous. And um and I've told this story before from a different perspective. He listen, he knew he he knew what he was. And I was throwing it in his face. You know, his father was a preacher, and he was treating me, in my eyes, not very well, doing the best he could to make sure that I could no longer be at the place I was at. I was fairly successful. He succeeded. He got me out. How he did it, though, it was crazy. He followed me around, spoke bad about me, asked questions about my character. And when that didn't happen, he changed or, you know, he was a part of changing my territory and giving me absorbing goals that I couldn't hit and ended up getting me out.
when, when you're a member of a community, you're looking for people to look out for you. Uh, or you don't feel like you're a member of that community. There have been communities that I was a part of and I was made to feel uncomfortable as a member of those communities. I was falsely accused in a couple of communities, proven falsely accused, um, which stunts your ability to grow and your family to grow. But in verse 4 it says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he tread out. This means the person that you're putting to work, the person that you're using. Because I know we're talking about ox. The only thing I know is ox tails. When I was growing up, we used to eat ox tails. Um. But you know, I, I I'm being I'm trying to I'm, I'm being a little funny. But an ox goes out and you put uh, I don't know what they call them, but some kind of a yoke on them. I think that's what you call them. And if you don't want the ox as he's pulling the ground or as he's um, uh, uh, bringing in the harvest, helping to bring in the harvest. You put a muzzle on his face so the ox can't eat along the way. So many in our community, as we call them, the black community, will put a muzzle on the people that they're using. They limit their growth. They pay them less than their value. Or if they if they pay them at all, they make people feel like I'm doing you a favor by allowing you to work with me. So here, take what I give you. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treads out. This is a form of wickedness. This is selfishness. Verse 5. If brethren, if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without a stranger, without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be, verse 6, the firstborn which she bear shall succeed in the name of the brother. Everyone wants to, t you, you listen, not everyone. You, you may want to focus on the sexuality of a brother sleeping with his, hus with, with his, with his brother's ex-wife. I'm sorry, with his brother's wife after he's died. The principle is to continue the name of thy brother. Of your brother. And the firstborn continuing his name. So if your brother's name was Guido Siblevich, then the son, firstborn son, shall be Guido Siblevich. Don't ask me where I got those names from. I'm just saying. <laughs> the whole purpose is to raise up a family lineage. But when you're thinking selfishly, you're not really interested in being a part of a communal idea of family. You don't want 
the liability, the responsibility of being communal. So you don't want to sleep with your brother's, your dead brother's wife, which today in today's society in 2024, that sounds weird. But again, it's not about the sex. It's about the community. And keeping the family line going. Verse 6, And it shall be the firstborn which she, which she bears shall succeed in the name of the brother. Listen, I, I understand today, in, especially in America, we don't follow these practices for the most part. I'm sure some may. I don't know. I don't know anyone who actually does. But the principle, when my, when my uh, daughter's grandfather died, uh, mom, I call her mom, mom stayed alive, but she married into the family. And she was the second wife of the family. In other words, grandpa's second wife is being taken care of by grandpa's daughters and son. They talk to her and treat her like she was mom. They talk to her and treat her no worse than the mother that just passed away about a year ago. Do they have to? No. But the idea is to take care of all family members, birth in or not. And this is something that at least in my daughter's family, on her mother's side, they do pretty well. They do very well. They take care of mom as well as they took care of their own natural mom. If not better, because of how she lived. The, the lady lives very, very well. Close to 90 years old. These are moral obligations. This isn't about your sexual preference because you can't get beyond your Western thinking or your, or your democratic thinking. These are just moral obligations of the community to take care of one another. One another. I'm going to jump all the way down to verse 17. We'll finish up in this, with this group of scriptures. Remember what Amalekite did unto thee, by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt. How he met thee, by the way, and smote the hindmost of thee, all feeble behind thee. And when thou faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore, it shall be when the Lord thy God has given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God give thee an inheritance to possess it, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalekite from under heaven Thou shalt not forget. So I want to I want to end with this because again we're talking about selfishness and wickedness. I don't know if you remember this. The Amalekites were the tribe were, were, uh, is a nomadic tribe. They didn't believe in the one God. They just believed that there were gods in everything. Which technically, I get 
how they're thinking, but there's one God that created all. It's just not the way they thought. And the way they would win is they would go in as a nomadic tribe and adopt the practices of <laughs> that, that territory they're taking over. I guess you could call I guess you could call them chameleons. I would call them chameleons. Wicked people are the greatest chameleons. They they know how to get what they want. They recognize that if you want something you can make a person feel comfortable by adopting their practices all while bringing in your thought patterns. And they take advantage of weak-minded people. God says, don't forget the Amalekites or the Amalek. Don't forget them because they come in and they suck the life out of weak people. And, and then he says, don't forgive. I want to read that one more time because I thought we were always supposed to forgive. Oh, it's perfect timing. Deuteronomy 25, I think it's 14, verse, uh, no, sorry, 19. And he says, Thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt, shalt not forget. The reason why is because when you forget, I'm sorry, not forgive, is forget. The reason why you don't want to forget is, is because these people, the Amalek, are savvy. And they will come in behind you and they will change minds because they're wicked. They know exactly what they're doing. The part that's left unsaid is If you understand the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and you become selfish, you become like Amaleks. You prey on the weak because you're selfish. Selfishness destroys the idea of a kingdom being built in the name of heaven. And it's not done by sinful people. It's done by people who know exactly what they're doing. They understand exactly exactly what compromise they are making to get what they want because they're not concerned about the community. This was a tough lesson. At least it was for me. I never, I pray, I never be an Amalek in anyone's, in anyone's life. I pray that I, that I never walk past my brother's wife and disrespect her. I pray that I will always honor the men and women in my life. Um, I pray that people will see God in me 
so that I can be a productive member of the community, even when it's tough. And I pray that God is glorified in all of it. Cash app, dollar sign, the Mr. Paul Dozier. Cash app, dollar sign, the Mr. Paul Dozier. We're on a journey from Genesis to Revelation. I don't know how long it's going to take, but we're on that journey. This one didn't feel good. I, I don't I don't think any all the lessons are going to feel good. This one didn't feel good at all. This tapped into some old things that were really hard for me to deal with as I was coming up, rooting out that which is wicked that just doesn't line up with the word of God. And instead of saying that the Old Testament is not relevant, saying, huh, questioning my understanding instead of questioning God's word. Hmm. Zell, if you're in America, you ask paulcdozier at gmail.com. That would be helpful. If these videos are helpful to you, they'll be helpful to other people. Please like and share them. Uh, with family, friends, business partners, what have you. And thank you for taking the journey with me, and thank you for taking the journey with those who are called to usher in the kingdom of heaven. Bye-bye.